Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, what a wonderful opportunity for us to come together, though online, at the entrance of a new Sabbath. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being with us throughout the day and throughout the past six days, Lord. You are our God. You are our Creator. You are everything to each one of us, Lord. Everything that we go through in life, we know ultimately it is for our own good. And we pray as we journey on this earth that we will always listen to your voice, be blessed by it, and walk by it so that our calling and election will be sure. Father God, in a very special way, I want to thank you, Lord, for the speaker, Lord, Paul. I pray that you will be with Brother Paul as he shares your word, that you will anoint him with your spirit, and that you will continue to use him for your great, for your cause and for your glory, so that many will be blessed by his messages wherever he speaks, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the final herald, Lord, that has been doing a wonderful ministry, and I pray that you will continue to bless uh, Brother Godwin, Sister Ruth, and the children, and I pray that you will continue to lead them and guide them to a Lord. While thanking you so much for everything you have done for us, lead us and guide us in the days ahead. This is a humble little prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Take my love, my Lord, my Lord, and thy feet. 
Good evening. My name is Paul Howe, and this evening I will be sharing about God's love. I will be sharing about how we can accept God's love, enjoy God's love, how we live in God's love and share that love, letting God's love throw, flow from him into us and out to others. I could kind of put all of this under the umbrella of living with Jesus in the love that he has poured into our lives. I'm not a thought theologian, and I'm certainly not a pastor. I'll be sharing some experiences God has given me to illustrate some of the concepts, but I want to start with what God has to say about love as recorded in the Bible. I'll be reading a few brief sections from 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 9, and I may pause here or there to parenthetically explain a few points, but <clears throat> let's get started. Verse 9. By this, the love of God was revealed in us, that God has sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, I just want to pause and paraphrase here and say that no one has seen God visibly. We don't walk around and find people who have seen Jesus Christ in the flesh, but they see you and they see me. And if God's love is present in our lives, People will see that love when we live with Jesus in his love. And we'll be getting more into that uh, a little bit further on. But I just wanted to highlight that people are not able to see God in the flesh at this very moment in time, at least very few people and not very frequently. But they can see you. They can see me. We are not invisible for better or for worse. And they can see God's love or the lack of his love, unfortunately, in some cases, as evident in the way in which we live our lives. Back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. And again, let me just parenthetically insert here that we need to remain in God. It's not just stopping by and chatting for a few minutes each day. We need to be together with God. The Apostle Paul talks about praying without ceasing, remaining in God. And, and again, we'll illustrate this point a little bit further, but we need to remain in God. Going to verse uh, 19 of 1 John chapter 4, we love because he first loved us. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Beautiful, timeless verses that ring down with relevance from the time they were written straight to our day and age. Uh, I could... I get almost in there, but I do want to make it a little more practical and accessible, and I'll, I'll start with a story. Quite a few years ago, I went to college at what was then Columbia Union College in Tacoma Park, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington, D.C. As you may know, Washington, D.C. is not only the capital of the United States, but also is something of a, a capital of the arts, although perhaps New York City, to some degree Los Angeles, might um, contest that. Hopefully no one's offended, but there's a lot of beauty in the arts available in Washington, D.C., um, and I personally love classical music. I have been playing viola for quite a while, although I am now extremely rusty. But at a certain point, I can play with a reasonable degree of proficiency. And I, I certainly have always enjoyed classical music, have loved attending concerts and 
Washington DC is full of great classical music concerts, perhaps particularly around Christmas time. Of all the concert halls in DC, and there are a number of excellent venues, the Kennedy Center is perhaps the best known concert hall in DC. And every Christmas, there's a series of, of fantastic concerts. And of course, not only at the Kennedy Center, the National Cathedral also has beautiful, beautiful music. Uh, but I'm particularly partial to the Kennedy Center, and, and you'll see uh, more about that in a moment. But uh, at this point in my life, about 18, close to 19 years ago, I was very interested in a young lady named Petra, who uh, is now my wife. Uh, we've been married for almost 15 years, but at that point, we weren't even dating yet. But I decided to invite her to a really special concert at the Kennedy Center. And one of the reasons it was special was there was a French horn solo and Petra plays the French horn. And for many, many reasons, it just seemed like the perfect fit. Before I go on in the story, I need to, again, kind of parenthetically insert something here that will become relevant in just a moment. I personally am not well known within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, it's true, I was the CEO of a Adventist hospital in Ethiopia for several years, and I was also the country director of one of the larger ADRA offices in the world. Uh, but this, this was in places and contexts and remote areas where you know, most people, most Adventists have never even heard of these places, let alone of me. Uh, but when I was in college, back at Columbia Union College in Tacoma Park, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C., I had a very close friend who's still my friend today, fortunately for me, perhaps less so for him, as we'll see in just a moment. But uh, my friend, as the years have gone on, has become quite famous within the Adventist church. If I were to mention his name right now, you, or at least many of you, would recognize the name. And this friend of mine was also interested in a young woman, and we decided to do a double date to the Kennedy Center. Seemed perfect. You know, what could go wrong in this wonderful scenario? Great concert, great concert hall. It just seemed like the, the, the perfect, perfect way to kind of end out the semester after some, some lousy final exams. And I don't know if any of you remember your final exams, but I, I personally, I still have nightmares about walking into an exam and I, I haven't even you know, prepared for anything and uh, just a complete mess. Uh, and we'll get to preparation in, in another story in a moment. But this friend and I sat down and it was, the, I don't know, what could be considered the early days of the internet. Some of the first online bookings, the Kennedy Center was a, a pioneer in the field of online bookings. And we got ready to book our tickets. And of course, the best tickets were gone already, but there were still some very good tickets left. And we were looking at options and I, I decided to go all out. I booked the best tickets that were still available. They weren't cheap and I was not rich at this point in time. Uh, I, I considered myself fairly broke as a matter of fact, but I coughed up $110 each for two tickets. Now, my famous friend, or maybe he was famous then, but much more so now, um, he wasn't any more broke than me. I, I certainly remember uh, the car he drove at that point was a whole lot nicer than the car that I was driving. But uh, he could have kind of sprung for the better tickets, but decided to go with the absolute cheapest tickets that he could find. He booked those. I booked um, the best tickets that I could get. And um, we asked the young ladies, and by some miracle, um, one of many miracles uh, in my relationship with Petra, she, uh, she said yes, which was quite surprising to me. Uh, I, I wouldn't have known what to do with the, the ticket if she had said no, but I, I kind of threw my hat over the fence with that one, uh, booked the ticket, asked her, she agreed, and <clears throat> the evening arrived. And I could tell a whole other set of stories about the, the meal we had together and the drive down to the concert hall, which involved considerable confusion and all kinds of different problems. But I'll just fast forward that to, to kind of get to the point here. We arrive at the concert hall and Petra and I went right up to our seats, our ticket counter punched them in and we went up to our seats and we had a box on stage left 
pretty much the front row, stage left, box over the stage. We could see the expressions on the conductor's face. We could hear the music well. We could see everyone in the orchestra. And we had a fabulous evening. Uh, unfortunately, we had some bumps later in the row. There's a reason it took us several years to, to end up married, but that, that's a whole other story. But this particular evening was fabulous. <clears throat> now, my famous friend and his date went to their seats. And you wouldn't even think that a concert hall as good as the Kennedy Center would have seats like these seats that he had purchased. They were way in the back of the concert hall, way back and crammed against a corner wall. In fact, they were squeezed in so tightly that the two seats weren't side by side. They were kind of at an angle to each other and at an angle. So as they, you know, the, this young lady and my famous friend were, were trying to, to view the concert, they, they couldn't look at it directly. They're kind of looking over their shoulder like this and they weren't even sitting together and not that they could see anything, they would have need, needed powerful binoculars to see anything on stage. And the looking around, they noticed that <laughs> some of the other people who had booked seats like theirs near them had actually brought some really powerful binoculars. And <clears throat> eventually the, the date that my uh, friend had brought kind of boldly asked one of these other people, may I borrow your binoculars so that I can see what's going on? And of course, my my friend, who's actually quite a tall uh, man, felt just like about this tall at that moment. He hadn't brought binoculars and booked these seats that weren't even together. And it was it was a real fiasco uh, for them. And for Petra and I, it was, it was just fabulous. Now, I'm going to make a little bit of a stretch here and, and say that, uh, you know, I believe that if my friend could rewind put the clock back, he would have sprung for the better tickets. Uh, it's, it's a source of uh, a regret for him, I believe. Uh, and, you know, it's just kind of easy for us to laugh at, at mistakes like this when we get the cheap seats and end up with a date that's broken before it begins. Uh, but sometimes I think we do something similar. It's really easy, in case you haven't noticed, to give God the cheap seats in our lives. You know, John in the book of Revelation talks about Jesus knocking in the door of our hearts. And, and sometimes we open the door and just kind of leave God in the doorway. We have a nice little chat. I don't know if you had any of those sort of chats during COVID where people, you know, they we were kind of scared to be too close to each other. So someone would come for a visit and instead of inviting them into the house, you'd open the door and then everyone stands a long way apart. And, Hello, how are you? I think I'm okay, but I don't know for sure. Have this sort of a conversation and and we do that with God. We, we stay far apart from him sometimes. We were opening the door, but we're not really entering a relationship. And when we do take the time to sit down, we're often seated in the cheap seat, some way away from where the action it, it, it is that actually God wants us to be connected with. It's, you know, it seems so intuitive, but... Uh, <sighs> Sometimes we think that we're just saving time by not giving God very much time and saving our effort by not really investing much with God. But, you know, I think when we're in heaven, when we're looking back at this, we, we may feel like my friend feels today that uh, you know, we're just robbing ourselves of a meaningful relationship by going for the cheap seats and in the relationship we have with God. Now, I, I need to mention a little bit about preparation. We read in 1 John about remaining in God, staying close to God. Uh, that's not always an easy thing to do. As I believe any married person will tell you, at least anyone who's been married for longer than about uh, five minutes, I would I'd venture to guess. Uh, love is sometimes very hard work. Uh, Sometimes it involves a lot of sacrifice. And if we look at the Bible, we see this is actually Jesus' experience. His love for you and for me cost Jesus his life. 
He gave us everything. Now, you think that that incredible sacrifice would be more than enough to get us out of bed in the morning so we can spend quality time with God and, and study and in prayer, but it's all too easy and all too common, at least for me, I hope not for you, to avoid G devotions or just spend a little time with Jesus when we feel busy or, or feel rushed. It's, it's easy to spend our time on other things. Sometimes devotions just, you know, there are moments in devotions when we feel God is speaking directly to our soul and the floodgates of heaven are poured out for us. But there's other times when I'm opening my Bible and I'm just like, oh, God, oh, it, it's, it's hard work sometimes. And I, I want to illustrate that a little bit with a, with a story uh, about me when I was even younger than, than the Kennedy Center story. But it also involves music. There's a, maybe a little bit of a theme here. Uh, I started taking piano lessons when I was three or four years old. I don't really remember. That was a very long time ago. Uh, and by the time I was about 13 or 14, I actually played the piano quite well. Uh, but there was one significant problem, and I hope it's a problem that you've never faced in your life, uh, whether you're a practicing follower of God or a practicing Seventh-day Adventist, but I personally didn't like practicing the piano. I avoided it. I would noodle around. I would play some chords and a melody or something like this and have fun, but when it came time for serious practice, mm, I'd rather be doing something else. And my piano teacher would have us do, uh, all of her students, one big recital per year. And uh, it was a big deal. She gave the recital in a, a large concert hall. Some of her students were very, very good. And a lot of people from the community would come out and listen to the recital. It was it was a big event in town. It wasn't a large town, but it was for the town, it was it was a big event. A lot of people would come out to this recital. And uh, typically I was not at all worried about this recital. Uh, at least not until I was playing my piece or about halfway through my piece, uh, sitting up there going da, da, da. all of a sudden, of course, because we were all playing by memory. It was unacceptable to use music. We were just playing by memory and I forgot what came next. Oh, but I didn't panic. Of course I didn't panic. I just went right back to the next kind of th thing that I remembered that I had played a little playing along. It came to the place and I still didn't remember. I still didn't panic. I went right back to the trying it again. I didn't remember. I think I went back three or four times and it wasn't working. I, there was a mental block. I didn't remember what was coming next. And so I just started playing some chords kind of in the right key and banged around a little bit, played some flashy stuff and entered the big, big chord, bum, 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 bum. And the whole audience was like, hmm, what was that? Because I was, I don't even remember. I think I blocked it out of my memory. It was some famous piece by Beethoven. Whatever I was playing at the end, it did not sound like Beethoven. I have some abilities in improvising in the piano, much less now than I did then. Uh, but whatever I was playing, it was not Beethoven. And everyone was like, hmm. And there was a little applause, but it was really faint and there's a lot of shuffling of feet, and uh, I was really embarrassed. I don't know if you remember your teenage years as, as clearly as I do, but I had some, some hard moments. And I think one of the hardest things in the world was being embarrassed as a, an early teenager. It was just miserable. Not long after that recital, I just quit taking lessons. And actually, it's one of my lasting regrets that I never became a really proficient piano player and I I definitely could have all that was missing was practice and I think for us as we're opening up our lives to God as we're letting his love flow into our hearts there are times where letting that love flow in is exciting and interesting and pleasurable and there are also times 
when our love relationship with God requires practice. It requires commitment. It may not be fun in that moment, but I hope and pray that you and I will continue to practice our relationship with God, to have that commitment to stay with Jesus, to remain in his love so that his love can permeate our beings and our lives. That is what we need. And it's important for us to be inundated with God's love, for that love to be a part of our lives, because as Adam and Eve found out way back in the Garden of Eden, Sometimes our love for God gets tested. Preparation time with God, those times of Bible study and prayer, strengthening the bonds of our relationship with Jesus, and actually living with him, not just having a hit and run relationship with him. When we have that tight connection, it's much harder for us to fall victim to temptation. And of course, we particularly need to prepare and accept God's love into our life through his word. <clears throat> it's no accident that when Jesus responded <clears throat> to Satan's temptations in the wilderness, it was by quoting scripture, fortifying our minds with God's word, particularly with the passages that show that God loves us, and he always will love us. It helps us keep God's love in mind when we face really challenging circumstances. And I, I'm not going to speak tonight about some of the challenges that I've faced in my life, but I will tell you, I have faced some tough times. And the worst of them were times when, when it was my fault. That's always the hardest. I don't know if that's your experience, but if, if it, I'm facing a tough time that's because someone else did something, I can kind of pull myself together and stoically accept it. But if it was because of my own stupidity, my own bad choices, my own knowingly bad choices, whew. but if we have spent that time with God. If God's word is in our minds so that we know that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter what mistakes we make, God's love for us is consistent and unfa unfailing. When we know that, that God is love and that love is for us and it's always available, we can ride out the challenges that come. Now, I, I want to talk about God and his love from, from maybe a slightly different angle. I love mangoes. And to say I love them is not too strong of a word. I really love mangoes. Back when I used to live in Ethiopia, one of the best parts of living there was the mangoes. I would sometimes be driving along the road and see a pile of mangoes, like a pile of mangoes that was almost as big as the old Toyota Land Cruiser that I was driving, a big pile of mangoes. And I, there were many times when I would stop and buy 50 kilos of mangoes. Now, I would share some of those, and some of those would be frozen and turned into mango sorbet, which is just about the best thing that has ever been made other than the straight up mango. The sorbet is unbelievable. But <clears throat> I would eat mangoes and I just wouldn't eat a few. Sometimes I would eat 20 mangoes a day. And if anyone doubts that, that figure, I'm happy to produce witnesses. I could produce a long list, list of witnesses who've seen me eat 20 mangoes a day. And you know, the thing is, I never got tired of mangoes. And I, you know, I'm not actually alone in loving mangoes. There's been a number of studies that show that mangoes are the most popular fruit in the world. However, there are still many people in this world who have never tasted a mango. A lot of them actually live uh, up here in Maine, in the northeast of the United States, where we certainly are not able to grow mangoes up here. There's still a lot of ice and snow outside my house while I'm talking, and it's springtime, and it's still like enough snow to go sledding out there. My girls are out there sledding right now. There's no way we could grow mangoes, and many of our friends and acquaintances have not tasted a mango. So 
it's been my privilege to introduce many people to mangoes for the very first time. And you know, people look at this strange looking fruit with a big seed in the middle and they say, Paul, uh, what does this thing taste like? And I say, hmm, it tastes sweet. It's tangy, is juicy, is delicious. But you know, just think about that for a second. Sweet, tangy, juicy, delicious, kind of describes just about every fruit in the world. So the only real way to know what a mango tastes like is to actually, you know, bite into one and try it to experience it. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, taste and see that God is good. But how can people taste? Now there is God's word and God is you know, in his word is revealed through the Bible and people can read the Bible, but you know, people can't see God. Just like we, we read in, in 1 John chapter 4, people aren't really seeing God on a regular basis. So it's, you know how people taste God these days? It's through the experiences that they have with you and with me. It's through those encounters that people have with those of us who have God's love in our lives. And that's one reason why it's really important for us to be filled with God's love, because we are ambassadors. We are representatives of God. And the experience that people have of God's love is it's largely uh, through their experience with you and me. Now, sometimes I feel like I've spent my whole life working at one job or another kind of job. I don't know if any of the rest of you feel like you spend a lot of time working, but I've spent a lot of my life working. And sometimes jobs are such a big part of our lives. It feels like we've spent the best years of our life working away in one job or another job. And we hardly have time to do anything else except work. And sometimes I'm tempted to think, you may feel tempted to think that work is getting in the way of, of sharing the gospel. But actually, I believe the way that you and I do our jobs makes a much bigger difference in the way that people experience God's love and the way the gospel spreads and the way people are actually able to taste and see what God is like. The way we work makes a much bigger difference than anything else we do, and certainly than anything we can say. In these day and age, you know, it's, it's, talk has is, is always been cheap, and it's cheaper now than I think it's ever been before. What really counts is genuine actions, genuine acceptance of God, and people can see that when God's love is part of us and flowing out through our lives. Many of you are probably well aware of, of the crisis that happened in Afghanistan. There was a, a change in government and many people, including a number of Christians who had been living, you know, at least with some degree of uh, uh, space and uh, freedom might be the wrong word in this context. But uh, with the new government that's now in Afghanistan, it happened very quickly for some people, unexpectedly, very violently. Uh, life in Afghanistan became extremely risky and there are still many people who are living there right now under extremely difficult circumstances but at this this moment when there was the change it's just just a few months ago last year many organizations got involved with evacuating people from afghanistan with resettlement and all kinds of different things going on and it was a privilege for me to volunteer with a Christian organization. It was not a large organization, one of the smaller organizations, but one of the organizations that was basically rescuing people and, and helping them to resettle and rebuild their lives in places where they were safe. A wonderful mission, really meaningful work. And the way this organization did things, it felt beautiful. We started meetings with prayer. We ended meetings with prayer. We talked about the gospel throughout our work. It was, you know, felt like a spirit-filled sort of a, a, a workplace. And 
there was just one problem. Unfortunately, the organization was really disorganized. And there were some people who did excellent work. And I tried to be one of those people. Uh, most of the time, I certainly tried. But in general, uh, for the organization as at all, it just, I don't want to say too much here because there's some wonderful people who I know who are still involved in this organization who are doing their best and God you know, has worked through this organization. God can work through all kinds of bad circumstances and imperfect people like you and like me, but, but this organization is just sloppy and unprofessional. And unfortunately for people who tasted God through their interaction with this organization, it left a bad taste in their mouth. I don't know if you've ever bitten into a mango that looked gorgeous on the outside, but when you tasted it, it was, you know, it was kind of a little past, maybe even a little bit rotten. That certainly happened to me. Sometimes when I was eating a whole bunch of mangoes under a short period of time and I'd bite into one without really kind of doing a thorough sniff test, you know, one of our, our friends who has eaten all kinds of food in all kinds of countries, so they, when you meet something you don't really know, at first you sniff it, and then you lick it. If it's okay, you take a small bite, and if that bite's okay, you take a big bite. And it's a sound system. It works under almost all circumstances. But sometimes when I was eating mango, I'd get too busy to do the whole lick and sniff and little bite. I'd just put in a big bite. And if it's a bad mango, it's just, it's, it's horrible. And you know, for some people, if the bad mango they, they bite into, if it's that first one, they may never want to taste a mango again, ever. Uh, I've actually met a few people who had those sort of experiences. And, and for people who have never experienced God and his love and their first exposure to that, or one of their biggest exposures to that is like a bad tasting mango because of something being sloppy and unprofessional with no excellence, it's hard to recover from that. It's not enough to have a good mission and, and the right words, but the way in which you and I work in everyday work, it doesn't have to have anything officially to do with the gospel or not. The way we do our jobs makes a huge difference in the way that people experience God and God's love. So in that way, every one of us is equally as much an ambassador or missionary or representative or, or pick your word uh, for God and his love as, as really anyone else would be. Now, this might be the right moment for me to, uh, to make a little bit of a confession here. Um, I would not be sharing this talk except that Petra, my wife, pushed me to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually working two jobs right now. I've got a lot going on in my life. If you can see the, the dark circles under my eyes, I hope you can't, but you probably can. And there's some, some good or bad or whatever you want to call them reasons why I've been pushing really, really hard. Uh, <laughs> But we've been married, uh, you know, 15 years, and there have been different times in life where I've wanted to go one way, and, and Petra's wanted to go the other way, and uh, usually, almost always, <laughs> we go the way she wants to go, and I was thinking about this as I was getting ready for this evening. I was thinking about all the times over the years when she's encouraged me to do things that I didn't really want to do, like go to Ethiopia go to Sudan, have our first child, our second, our third, and, and now we're going to have four. And, you know, I, I came to realize that if I had not done the things that my wife wanted me to do, I'd have missed most of the good stuff that's happened to me in my life. So by the grace of God, you know, I'm here today because there was someone, there is someone who's a part of my life, a very big part of my life who has brought me here, and I'm talking to you over this um, Zoom animal that I, I don't really like Zoom, but it is what it is, and, and you know, here we are. I'm here because of Petra. The way in which we treat each other as individuals, as Christians, 
makes a critical difference in how other people are able to experience God's love. You know, the way we work is important. And within that, in work and outside of work, uh, the way we treat people makes a big difference. You know, speaking of, of work a little bit, and I'll, I'll go back to people. Uh, one of the companies I work for has been hiring quite a number of positions recently. And, and somehow I found myself on a bunch of interview panels. And I've been fascinated to see that, you know, during the, you know, the first part of the interview, I'm in the panel and we ask all these supposedly tough questions to the candidates. But toward the end of the interview, the people who we are interviewing turn the thing around and ask questions of us. And there's one set of questions that always comes out. It's, uh, <clears throat> is your team uh, supportive? Do you in this organization trust each other? Do you care about each other? Is there transparency, accountability? Is there clear communication? Do people value each other? Is there honor, respect, dignity? That is really interesting. It kind of goes to the culture of the organization. There's many different reasons why people choose jobs. And there's been a lot of research into this topic, which I won't bore you with tonight. But salary, how much money a job pays is a big deal. And it's a, a reason why people choose one job or, or, or another job. But the culture, the way people treat each other within a workplace, if there is that sort of value for each other and each other's contributions as people, uh, it makes just as big of a difference in why people choose jobs as does the salary that the job pays. And I would venture that the same thing is true of the churches that you and I attend. Now, don't get me wrong, theology is extremely important. I'm grateful to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I believe all of our doctrines. With that said, for most people, their church attendance is much more likely to be based on the way in which we treat each other and the way in which we treat them than any of our doctrines. You know, God and his love are, are revealed in the relationships that he has with each one of us individually. But you know, we don't have to look beyond the, you know, the book of Revelation or really the whole story of the gospel to see that God's love, his character, cannot be fully represented to the world just in the relationship that he has between you and me, although that's certainly a big part of things. It's God's relationship between him and his people, between God and his church. It's God's character, his love, that people can see in our lives as the body of Christ. So the way in which we treat each other, you know, if we allow God's loves in, into our lives as, as individuals and as a community, uh, it makes a absolutely massive difference in how people experience God and in how God tastes to them. Uh, it's not just about how their one-on-one -on -one interaction goes with us. It's their family and our family, uh, their community, our community, becoming one community in Christ Jesus. That is how God's love works in the lives of the people that we interact with. You remember the guy that I talked about before? This famous, famous, I shouldn't put quotations, he's famous friend of mine um, who bought the cheap seat at the Kennedy Center. And the years since that disastrous double date, this guy has been a consistent and faithful friend. He has accepted God's love into his life, and God's love just flows out of him like a river. It's incredible, and it, it really touches everybody he comes in contact with. Uh, I've had some really hard times in my life, and I suspect you have too. And, and sometimes in these difficult moments, often particularly in the moments when it's, it's our own fault when we're in trouble, there's this tendency when all of our friends just evaporate. You know, it's like the story of the prodigal son. He had all the friends and he had all the money. And when he ran out of money, his friends were all gone. Most friends disappear when we're really in deep trouble.
but sometimes there are a few friends who stick around. And this guy, this guy who bought the cheap seats at the Kennedy Center, he is one of these incredible people that when someone's in trouble, when I've been in trouble, he comes closer. The times when my life has been the worst, he's just been like right there beside me. And you know, the thing is, it isn't just me. He's, he's got this history and a pattern of when people are in trouble, he comes close. I, I fully believe that, you know, he, you know, he may not have picked the right seats at the Kennedy Center, but when we get to heaven, his, his crown is going to be so full of the stars that represent all the people that are in heaven because of him. His crown is going to be so full of these stars and so big, he's going to need like some sort of a neck brace to hold the thing up. He, you know, if all of us as God's sons and daughters treated each other with the love and honor and dignity and respect, if we all accepted God into our lives, God's love was just flowing out of our lives like this guy, you know, the whole world would be full of Christians. It, 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 there's nothing more powerful in terms of evangelism than just pure disinterested love flowing from God through us into others. People can see we are living with Jesus. They're like, wow, that is so incredible. We want to do that too. And it, it becomes a whole lot more contagious than in COVID or any of these other things like that. People just start wanting to be close to God because they see God's love in action. And you know, this, of course, is why Jesus, in one of the last messages he gave to his disciples, and we can pick this up in, in John, there's this grand uh, closing soliloquy, basically, before Christ's crucifixion. And we can pick it up in uh, at least a small fraction of it. And, and time we have left. And in John chapter 13, starting in verses 34, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. And he, he goes into the fact that it's not just a completely new commandment, right? But it's a new commandment that you love each other just as I have loved you. That's how I want you to love each other. If each of one of us accept God's love fully into our lives if we don't give god you know any of the cheap seats in our life if we if we fully taste how good god's love is and let that love be available for others if you know we remain in him and practice our love a committed relationship not just a hit and run relationship with god where we open the door and then yell at each other from 50 feet away if we come close and remain in God and remain in God's love. By this, going back to John 13, verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that love for one another is the love for each other just as God has loved you and me. And that's not something we can do on our own. It's not just a choice we can make. I'm going to love. I'm going to do it. Mm. No, no, no. It's the love that we accept from God. He loved us first. And if we accept that love and live in that love, it just flows out through our lives. This love theme just continues through these chapters, but I'm going to jump ahead to John chapter 15, verse 9. Jesus says, just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Remain in my love. And tonight, I want to encourage you that with all the crazy things that are going on in the world in which we live, with all of the problems that we face in our lives, we, we need to remain, to remain, to stay in the love that God has made available for you and for me. If we remain in his life, if love, if we live in that love, he gives us his best. We give him our best. And that love flows through us. We, it's not, you know, we're not giving him the cheap seats in our life, and then we're not giving anyone else the cheap seats either. God's love is just in us and through us in every part of our being. We need to remember 
that people experience God through us. They, the way that they taste God depends on the way that you and I are tasting God. And so we need to regularly make sure that we are spending time in God's word, eating the bread of life so that other people can taste what this goodness is that we're consuming. If we really give God that first place in our lives, if we stay you know, close to him throughout the day, throughout every moment, and, you know, particularly, I, I've been blessed in, in the past couple of weeks, and my daughters have been memorizing chunks of the, the Bible, sometimes the songs that my wife writes, sometimes the songs that they themselves write, and they're just four years old and six years old, but as I can see them putting more and more of God's word into their, their small you know, minds. And God works through that word in their minds that when different problems happen, and sometimes it's because I do something wrong as a parent, God is there in their life. It's, you know, it's in their heart. God's word is there. And so when bad things happen and, you know, all kinds of things happen. We, we have a wonderful dog, but sometimes the dog gets a little rambunctious and knocks people down and may not sound like much, but if you're a, you know, a two-year-old and you're knocked down by a, a, a large dog, it seems almost like, you know, the end of the world. But the more that, that they are able to keep that, that love and that they, they bounce back up and, you know, that song that God has put in their life through his word, it, it flows out and it keeps them consistent. I remember, you know, I, I talked about how uh, I sometimes have nightmares about preparing for exams. Uh, the exams that I was the most confident on, the tests that I walked into knowing that I was going to do well, it was where the teacher had been generous enough to tell us in advance uh, what was going to be on the test. One of the most wonderful things about being a Seventh-day Adventist is we have the luxury of, of knowing what's going to be on the final exam. We know what's coming in the world. We know that the challenges, the wars, the rumors of wars that we see are only going to increase. I, I remember when my wife was going into labor with, with our first three kids, and, and believe me, you know, somehow the, the, the joy of the birth that she just kind of forgets all the all the pain and suffering but I was with her for every contraction for all three of these kids well one of them I barely made it because I was parking the car and the baby was born just as I walked in the room that was kind of a, a special case of driving in Khartoum in the middle of a celebration and, and you know there was a, a revolution getting ready to happen but but in, for, for the other two I was there for every contraction and I, I, I remember that pain uh, that in in her and that I was feeling because there was nothing that I could do about it in fact it was my fault that she's in the middle of this. it was horrible uh, those contractions speeding up and Jesus talks about how these problems that we see in the world are just going to get closer together and more and more intense and you and I know exactly what's coming and we know exactly how to prepare we get ready by living in the love that Jesus has made freely and fully available to you and for me. And tonight, it's my hope and my prayer that each one of you who's listening, wherever you are, whoever you are, accept that love into your life. Stay in that love so that as the problems in this world get more intense and more regular. And as Satan's attacks ramped up, we're secure. We're tight in that love that God has given us so that nothing can move us, nothing can shake us. And I, you know, I encourage you to, to read the Daniel and Revelation, be fully informed on, on end-time prophecies. That's a very important and, and worthy task, but nothing is even close to as important as staying connected to God's love. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 or 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about, you know, 
all these things that are that are part of uh, walking with with God and, and living with Jesus. But the greatest of these, the most important of these, the one of these things that if that's missing, everything else is worth nothing is God's love. So at this time, at this moment in history, there is nothing more important. There has never been anything more important and there has never been anything more relevant today than fully accepting God's love into your heart, into your mind. Dear God, we come before you this evening, recognizing that we need your love in our lives and that we need to remain in your love at all times. There is no safe place outside of your love. And we are so deeply grateful that you have made your love so available to us. We ask that you would give us the courage, the consistency, and the commitment to stay in that love, to remain in that love, to practice our relationship, even at the moments when we don't feel like it, to build those bonds of love together with you and together as a community 
so that all those around us, whether they're interacting us, with us as individuals or as members of our community of faith, as interacting with us as a church, can just see your love, that they will know we are your followers because of your love that you have given to us that's in our lives and flowing out of our lives into everything we have contact with. We thank you and we praise you because you promised to do all of these things. All we have to do is ask. And so tonight, Lord, we ask, please fill us with your love. Please keep us in your love and help us to remain in your love until that day very soon when we will be caught up together with you in the sky and live forever with you in your love.